Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm David Schwartz, Chair of Medicine. I know a number of you are joining uh, Medicine Grand Rounds for the first time. Uh, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded uh, for uh, future reference. Um, please note uh, that uh, you will be muted when you enter into this meeting and use your chat box throughout the meeting to um, identify questions that you might have that I can pose to the four speakers uh, at the end of the uh, Grand Round session. So it goes without saying that COVID-19 has clearly captured our undivided attention and it represents uh, the medical challenge uh, of our lifetime. Uh, today we have four outstanding speakers to help us understand how we got here and also the challenges that lie ahead. John Samet is gonna go first and he's gonna present the epidemiology of this virus. Uh, Eric Pochula will uh, uh, discuss the virology. Uh, Steve Johnson is gonna present uh, the clinical course of individuals uh, with COVID-19. And uh, Tom Campbell will uh, discuss therapeutic uh, considerations. So to make sure that we have enough time uh, to uh, move through the four uh, talks, I uh, want to uh, let the speakers uh, have their, uh, their platform. I'm gonna first call on John Samet. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, race through uh, what we know about the epidemiology of COVID-19 and uh, provide you with an overview of some modeling that we've been doing in support of the Colorado Department of Public Health and uh, Environment. For a quick look at uh, the pandemic uh, statistics from yesterday and the day before, it's a pandemic, of course, because it has spread uh, globally uh, reaching literally every uh, continent. This map shows the distribution of the cases with these circles, of course, proportionate to the numbers. And you can see this uh, grim global uh, death uh, total that we know will go ever higher. If we look by uh, country, the United States is now in the lead uh, with regard to confirmed cases with uh, death lagging. The number of Cases, uh, of course, is problematic because there are different ways that they are ascertained uh, and identified. But if you look uh, on the time frame here, you can see how this epidemic uh, through these heat maps has evolved over uh, time in different countries and where it stands. John, now. John, this yes. is David. Could you just hold up for one minute? We're not seeing your slides. Um, huh, so. Okay. I, I wanna deal with this technical issue now so that we make sure that the presentations are clear. Um, you're sharing your screen. I'm sharing my screen. And uh, do you have this in uh, slide mode or? It's in uh, PowerPoint, yeah, it's in- uh, Presenter it mode? In slide view mode, do you think that will, let me see if this helps David, hang on a second. Does this, yeah, can you see it now? Yeah, that's much better I think, yep. Okay, let me not be in, uh, so, so just to wander back then very quickly, I showed the map of global cases and then had come to this chart showing the number of cases, number of deaths and the timeline uh, over here. Uh, the United States, of course, uh, you can see the hot spots, uh, the New York City uh, area, uh, the emerging epidemic uh, in Detroit, of course, uh, Louisiana down uh, below, and you can see uh, here we are in uh, Colorado. With regard to the top 10 states, we are uh, not in that list uh, at present uh, with heading for about 3,000 plus cases uh, today. Looking at uh, Colorado, <laughs> we have cases uh, everywhere, and I think probably most of you are familiar with the fact that Eagle uh, County in particular, likely because of Vail and uh, skiing and the impact of international visitors uh, has a surprisingly large number of cases at 213. And then of course, here's our 
Denver uh, metro areas with uh, large numbers of cases uh, throughout. Now, we've done a lot of work in modeling the epidemic, supporting uh, the CDPHE and providing estimates uh, to the governor's uh, office. This is one of our teams during the many uh, crunch meetings we've had as over the last couple of weeks, this group has worked uh, 24 seven drawing on uh, faculty at the School of Public Health, School of Medicine and the University of Colorado uh, Boulder. Now, mathematical models are useful. They're central to projecting the epidemic, to understanding future uh, bed needs, and to, uh, in the end, look at different scenarios of relaxation of the social distancing restrictions that we have. We try and base these models on what we understand about uh, disease transmission, and I'm going to take you very quickly through sort of the conceptual heart of our model. We're using what is called an SEIR model, susceptible, exposed, infected, uh, recovered. The model lays itself out like this, where we assume that only those who are symptomatic will enter uh, the hospital, that they will need either critical care uh, or not, and that uh, they will then be, of course, at risk of dying. And we make assumptions about the rates of dying that are aged based. The key parameters here are the reproductive number, R sub zero, R naught, that you've probably heard about, the number of new cases generated per ill person. And actually borrowed this uh, graphic from the governor's presentation on Friday, where he shows how with an R naught of three, as you exponentiate three, you very quickly reach large numbers of cases. Social distancing, and I hope everyone knows where this picture came from, is critical in terms of uh, reducing the risk of infection. And we use a social mixing uh, parameter that describes how mixed we are, uh, ranging from not mixing at all to living freely uh, as we were doing until several weeks ago. So in the model, we want to reduce the contact rate that's our social distancing between susceptible and getting exposed. And as a you know, tried and true strategy of infectious disease epidemic control, isolating uh, symptomatic cases, of course, and then doing uh, classic uh, contact tracing to uh, identify those individuals who are contagious and spreading the uh, disease. The uh, idea of social distancing, again, the slide taken from the press conference, is that there are different things that we can do to reduce uh, the degree of mixing. And uh, you know, again, here, there's some placement of these different measures that we have in place with regard to how much distancing is accomplished. And of course, we need some mixing because we have to go to the stores. There are essential uh, needs. But we are probably in the 60 70 percent uh, reduction of mixing at this, uh, at this point. This is being tracked in different uh, ways. Now, just to quickly go through the model findings for uh, Colorado, we offer these kinds of uh, projections. So what I'm showing you is for R0 of three over time, that's the x-axis, and I've left it dateless just so we don't get stuck with the dates. This is what the peak looks like for symptomatic infections with no social distancing. And then as we increase the degree of social distancing, you can see the curve flattens out. And when people are using the, the phrase bending the curve, what they're really talking about is moving from this steep peak to something more like that, giving the healthcare system the possibility, the chance of managing uh, the uh, epidemic, the needs for hospitalization and critical care. Of course, a consequence of social distancing that I'll just touch on briefly is if we flatten out the curve, if we were to stay socially distanced for a long time, in the end, we would have a large group of susceptible individuals when restrictions uh, are lightened. This is R0 equals three, and I'm gonna show you a picture where they're together. But again, the bottom line is that the epidemic is not so steep, it is more spread, uh, spread out. And 
a wide variety of R naught numbers have been used. You'll see numbers 2.5, you'll see three, and we're estimating the numbers directly from the Colorado data and what we uh, know from these estimates, which are uh, approximate subject to uncertainty is that the value is likely somewhere around um, above three. These are projections related to critical care needs, uh, current uh, critical care bed capacity in the state, allowing for uh, necessary uses uh, and expected rapid expansion by at least a thousand beds and then a longer run uh, projection. And you can see the need to spread out the curve uh, so that we don't exceed uh, critical care uh, capacity. Uh, and these are the R3, R3, R0, R0, R0 and R0, R0 estimates shown uh, side by side. And you can see what I described earlier that with a value of four, there's a steeper and faster and higher peak uh, than with three. And, uh, you know, we will are tracking where we may be with this as we move forward and continually up, uh, update our um, numbers. There are many groups now doing estimates, and one group that has received um, attention uh, in the last week is the group at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle, the same group that does the global burden estimates. Their numbers uh, seem to be driving now decision-making at the national level, and uh, I would suggest that you look there. They provide data for uh, Colorado. Their approaches are quite different from what we use, and I think, uh, in a sense, more, uh, more optimistic. So here is projected uh, Colorado uh, hospital uh, use uh, from uh, IHME. So let's see, now I'm stuck. So I'll just um, end here. Models are critical to what we're doing. There's not a right model. This is a well-known quote from the statistician uh, George uh, Box, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And clearly these um, models are now critical for um, making very important high level decisions uh, with regard to management of the epidemic. And our group will uh, continue uh, to work with uh, CDPHE and making predictions, likely for some months to come as we uh, think about how to relax restrictions. So with that, um, I'll stop and uh, turn to uh, my colleague, uh, Eric Persla, who's professor of medicine and chief of the infectious disease uh, division. Eric, you may be muted. Eric? I think you're muted, Eric. All uh, right, is that better? Yes, yep. Yeah. You may probably just start over again. Okay. Uh, Thanks, John. I'm going to be talking about SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virology of it, and the clinical implications for COVID-19. I'll start where things began for COVID-19 pretty recently, with bats. They belong to an ancient mammalian order, the Chiroptera, and they're broadly grouped into the large megachiroptera and the small microchiroptera. My lab's had occasion to think about these fascinating animals because we've been working for several years with cells derived from this large food bat on the left where we've identified interesting antiviral defenses. The present COVID-19 pandemic has more to do with the small echo rate locating bats on the right. Now we know from biophylogenetic data that the first SARS virus, SARS-CoV, and MERS virus emerged from bats and transferred to humans probably via intermediate mammalian hosts. In the case of SARS-CoV in 2003, this involves small exotic carnivores like the civet cat and um, other animals, possibly. In the case of MERS, it involved dromedary cat. Welcome to Zoom. Please in press pound, no. then enter your meeting ID, followed by the pound sign again. For SARS-CoV, 
the cause of the present pandemic, banks in the Genesoid Olympus are the likely reservoir. So as you probably heard, there's also an e some evidence that the pangolin, an anteater species, may have been involved in as an intermediate mammal, but this is actually still unclear. It's also unclear whether the uh, wet markets uh, um, in, in uh, Wuhan uh, were involved. It could, there's, it's not ruled out that the virus actually transmitted directly from bats to humans. So um, why bats and why do we keep hearing about them? These are ancient animals that diverged a long time ago in the late Cretaceous period, about 80 to 90 million years ago. They're not flying rodents by any means, and they're actually more related to horses and whales and mice or people. And of course, they have high medical evidence because they've been recurrent reservoirs for severe lethal human pathogens like these listed here, rabies, Nipah, Ebola, and um, the SARS viruses, and now SARS-2. Uh, um, I am going to be using a shorthand for SARS-CoV-2 and SARS, uh, uh, the first SARS virus, SARS-1 and SARS-2, um, to um, make this uh, uh, flow a little better. So why are these animals such prolific sources of viruses? Well, they're the only mammals that have ever evolved powered flight, which aids mobility and dispersal. There's more than 1,200 species, so they're incredibly abundant, uh, immensely abundant and diverse. They live in huge, dense colonies with, uh, with millions of single roosts. And they live a long time, often greater than 25 years, and so accumulate chronic viral infections. Um, I won't go into the details, but they also have um, intriguingly dampened innate immune systems, at least as we understand that from the perspectives of human and mouse immunology. Um, and uh, for example, a contracted interferon gene repertoire. So the picture that emerges is of chronic virus tolerance, viremia, and asymptomatic shedding. There were warnings about this, and these are just two prominent papers of many from 2015 and 2016 from Ralph Barrick's group at UNC Chapel Hill. And indeed, the whole emerging virus threat is a critically important one that will need more attention going forward. Now, SARS is the seventh coronavirus known to infect humans. The, um, I've listed over here on the left four of these seasonal viruses. These cause about 8 to 15 percent of upper respiratory infections and typically cause mild symptoms. They probably emerged hundreds of years ago in human populations. Now, the um, SARS and MERS viruses emerged more recently, and they obviously can cause severe disease. And what may be going on here is that there's been an increase in the human animal, animal interface in the late 20th century and uh, 21st century, which may be accelerating cross-species movement. This virus, SARS-1, is considered extinct in human populations, at least for now. And during that epidemic in 2003 or 4, um, community transmission did not eventuate, as is happening full scale here for SARS-CoV-2. Now, this is not the place to give a detailed um, description of the viral life cycle, so I'm just going to concentrate on a few things. I'm going to talk about the entry process, where the virus attaches through its spike protein to the ACE2 receptor, shown here in blue. And then there's a uh, cleavage activation step by a cellular enzyme called uh, furin that uh, cleaves the spike protein and activates it. I'll talk a little bit about the um, complicated RNA replication mechanism and where it happens, and then about replication factories on the production side of the cell. Uh, this is the virion and the receptor. Uh, this is an electron micrograph over here showing a budding uh, virion. Um, it's a, uh, a pleomorphic envelope particle with the genome enclosed by a helical nucleocapsid with an abundant membrane protein. Uh, this is the most abundant pro protein in the envelope uh, called um, uh, M protein. And then this is the spike protein, the spike S glycoprotein. There's several structures now that are quite good that are out about this at uh, a high angstrom re resolution. And this shows the um, receptor binding domain of that spike glycoprotein interacting with the human ACE2 receptor on the cell. Now, entering into the target cell is, uh, takes two critical steps. First, spike attachment to ACE2, and then spike activation. Um, and so after they attach, coronavirus spike proteins must then be cleaved by a cellular enzyme to activate their fusion capacity. And for this purpose, SARS-2 has acquired the ability to use an enzyme called furin, and SARS-1 lacks this. So why is this all important? Spike protein is a leading vaccine target, probably the leading target. 
Um, and uh, some interesting things are emerging. The ACE2 receptor is present on endovascular cells and cardiac myocytes as well as lung cells. And a main clinical issue arising now is viral myocarditis, both in UCH and elsewhere being reported all around the world. In addition, the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers elevate levels of ACE2 on the surface of cells. It's not clear what that means right now. That could be good, it could be bad, or neutral theories uh, for all three have been put forth. Um, and there's no recommendation now to um, start people on those drugs or to take them off it. There's a very good uh, review that appeared just yesterday in the New England Journal about this. Now, there's more. There's two very interesting things that happened on the way to SARS-2. First of all, and, and these matter because they both likely facil facilitated human emotion and, and spread and behavior of the virus in the body. So the affinity for ACE2 receptor of the SARS spike protein is tenfold higher than the SARS-1 spike according to emerging data. And there are six critical amino acids shown here by these black arrows at the bottom um, that mediate uh, the ACE2 receptor attachment. And five of them, the ones on the left, except for the sixth one, are different from SARS-1. But all six are identical in the pangolin virus, which may be proximate, and SARS-2. Now, um, the second thing that's even more striking, on the way from bats, the SARS-2 spike also acquired insertion of a new polybasic cleavage site for that cellular protein, protease furin that I mentioned. And the other proximal beta coronavirus is the pangolin one, et cetera, do not have this. So why is this important? Both things likely facilitated human emergence and spread. Insertion of this kind of furin activation site has also been shown to increase transmissibility of other respiratory viruses, particularly very pathogenic influenza viruses. And furin is also very abundant in our lungs and other organs, so that may be operative in tissue tropism. I just blowed up that polybasic cleavage site here. You can see these um, basic arginines are here, and uh, there's, there's four amino acids that are totally absent from these other viruses. All right. Now, um, after entry, we get onto the business of replicating and amplifying the viral genome. And here the virus has a real stealth maneuver. It sequesters its RNA replication process in what are called um, uh, viral replication factories in the cytoplasm. Now, these are not virus particles. These are large, abnormal, double membrane enclosed vesicles um, that it derives from cellular membranes, in the case of this virus, from the endoplasmic reticulum. And here's an electron tomographic 3D surface model of that. Here's the ER, here are some of these structures. Inside that is where the viral copying is going on. The RNAs are being um, uh, replicated and amplified. Now, people think of this as having two main functions. One is to sort of biochemically concentrate all the reagents needed to synthesize all those RNAs so that they can then be uh, translated or put into new virions. Um, but crucially, it also limits detection by key cellular warning systems that detect viral double-stranded RNA intermediates, um, which are flagrant warning signals to the cell, and are sensed by things like MBA5 and RIGI. So inside those replication factories is where the RNA genome is being replicated, and that's done by a viral whole enzyme in which four different viral proteins, NSP7, 8, 12, and 15, work together. 12 in red is the polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And that polymerase is inhibited by remdesivir, as Tom Campbell will tell you later, as a chain terminator. And um, a wrinkle that I don't have time to go into, but I flag for your attention, is that this virus is also, uh, the coronaviruses are the largest RNA viruses. They, their genomes are 30 kilobases. It doesn't get any larger than that for an RNA viruses. And to do that, they have a proofreading exonuclease that keeps them from making too many errors and sort of collapsing as they copy. That may also be a therapeutic target. And it turns out that when you take a mutant virus that's mutant and inactive in NSP14, remdesivir is more potent. So that could be a target for combination therapy, which of course we're very well used to doing in all sorts of permutations for HIV-1. Final point I'll make about this replication step is that when two different coronaviruses infect the same animal or person, there are high, high rates of recombination in which gene segments swap. So you have this virus and this virus in the same cell, what can come out is this virus. That can be up to 25% during mixed infections, which is quite high, and may possibly have been operative, operative in the origin of these viruses. Okay, 
Now, the question people will ask is, um, is the virus mutating? Is it changing? And will it evolve to greater or lesser variables? Well, you can track this in real time. And I just did this yesterday again um, on the next strain platform. And the map here shows viruses emerging, the blue ones in China, then uh, Europe, uh, uh, and so forth, and the green and yellow, North America, and over here. And on the right, you see um, individual virus sequences. It's, of course, the first, the Chinese ones emerged in December and January, and then you start seeing the other ones coming in. And this is an aggregator line that tracks the overall thing. And what, what you can see here, there are mut mutations all over the place. Um, but in aggregate, the substitution rate is really only about 23.8 per year, 22 to 24, as I've been tracking this. Um, that's reassuring in, in a large genome like this. And so I can say that um, at present, at least, there's no data ind to indicate evolution to greater or lesser virulence is particularly likely. This virus is already good to go. It's highly adapted. It's spreading very efficiently by using the human lung as an aerosolization device. Uh, now, quickly, an emerging concept in our hospital and across the world is that a dysregulated, overexuberant immune response to, um, uh, to the virus contributes to COVID-19 pathology. Things like IL-6 are mentioned, and those have been documented in animal models with SARS-1. This is a macaque lung after infection with SARS-1. This is a mock-infected animal's lung. And th these kinds of things get upregulated, and there are candidate immunosuppressives uh, being uh, considered for this kind of thing. In terms of immunopathogenesis, interferon receptor knockout mice actually survive SARS-1 much better than wild-type mice. Um, so interferon is a tricky thing here. It might be helpful early on, but when later sustained, it may provoke tissue damage um, and lung pathology and vascular leak. Finally, um, in terms of the adaptive immune system, there are big issues for antibody responses and durable individual herd immunity. This is data from SARS-1 patients uh, published in 2011. There's a distinct waning of memory B cell responses at six years. Um, they were undetectable in 21 of 23 recovered SARS patients. IgG may vanish. T cells are responses are maintained longer than that. And this has obvious implications for vaccines and convalescent plasma therapy. So I'd like to acknowledge my amazing colleagues in our ID division who are going above and beyond in countless ways. It's been really wonderful to see. Everyone else across the city who's contributing all that they are. I'd like to uh, shout out a special tribute to our nurses who are under a lot of stress and performing well. I'd like to uh, mention my lab members who know something about viruses and bats, and many researchers who provided fast data and info on frequent servers and elsewhere. Okay. Eric, thank you very much. Let's, let's move on to Steve Johnson. Uh, tell us a little bit about the clinical course. Well, welcome everybody. Well, Steve is getting set up. I want to encourage everyone to send me questions through the chat box. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Herschel, uh, for that uh, introduction. Thanks for allowing me to be part of this uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about clinical aspects of, of COVID-19, and I'll Try not to say something that will be uh, untrue about a month from now. I'll start out because this is a wider audience. I think it's important probably to mention the common clinical manifestations of, uh, of COVID-19. This of course is primarily a, uh, an acute lower respiratory tract infection. So in the initial series, and in subsequent studies has typically presented with these symptoms, including fever, fatigue, cough, myalgia, and dyspnea. The cough has been described as uh, typically a dry cough, although uh, a minority of patients do have- uh, I don't think you're yet sharing your screen. Sorry for the interruption. That better? David, is that better? Yes, it's better. Thank you very much. 
Sorry about that. Uh, I'll just start, start over a bit. Uh, common, men, uh, common clinical manifestations of COVID-19 are that of a, of a lower respiratory tract infection, typically with fever, fatigue, cough, myalgia, and dyspnea. The cough has been described as a dry cough, although a subset of patients uh, have sputum production. Um, fever uh, in the initial series in Wuhan, which is here in red, was almost invariably present. Uh, uh, this involved hospitalized patients only. In a subsequent series uh, in China, across 30 provinces involving both hospitalized and outpatients, on presentation, fever was only present about 40 some percent of the time. Although ultimately in the clinical course, the majority of individuals uh, had fever. There's been a variety of other reported symptoms, uh, including headache, uh, findings of upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, including rhinorrhea and sore throat, uh, conjunctivitis. There have been reports uh, that have gotten a lot of press about anosmia and dyscusia, and then also gastrointestinal complications, nausea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, including reports of individuals just presenting with, with uh, abdominal symptoms. Laboratory findings are typically a leukopenia uh, and uh, more specifically a lymphopenia, but leukocytosis can occur, elevated transaminase levels, elevated uh, LDH, and then elevated uh, inflammatory uh, models uh, levels. Uh, chest X-ray findings have typically included either ground glass opacities or consolidation. Uh, some of the reports had mentioned that these are typically bilateral, typically peripheral, but I think there has been a, a wide variety of uh, radiographic presentations. Now, we're not necessarily recommending uh, CT imaging in these folks, but there is a, uh, a fair amount of literature about the findings with uh, CT imaging. And so I thought I would use this to illustrate some characteristic images. So the image in the upper uh, left uh, indicates a, a unilateral uh, ground glass opacity uh, on the upper right, uh, a, a bilateral peripheral uh, opacities with septal thickening. And then uh, in the lower panel, uh, lower left, more of a consolidative picture. And then finally, uh, a mixed pattern with air bronchograms and pleural effusion. So again, I think in the setting of a very common infection, you may see a variety of clinical manifestations in terms of symptoms, laboratory findings, and radiographic findings. So the diagnostic test for COVID-19 is the SARS-CoV-2 PCR. Um, this virus uh, may be detected uh, before clinical symptoms, and of course, in asympt asymptomatic individuals, and, and asymptomatic individuals are certainly getting, getting a lot of discussion currently about a source of spread. Uh, the PCR testing of the nasopharyngeal swab is a highly sensitive test if properly collected and at the appropriate time of disease. So for example, later in the disease where it is uh, more of a lower respiratory tract illness, uh, there may be discordance between anatomic sites. For example, you might find it in endotracheal sputum when you don't find it on a nasopharyngeal swab. There are serologic studies that are in develop and, and may be, and may be uh, available in the next couple of weeks. And, and these, of course, will be helpful to detect the full spectrum of disease and also the extent of the epidemic. Symptomatic disease has been categorized as mild, moderate, severe, or critical. And some of the papers that have examined this illness have provided specific definitions for these categories. Of course, the infection may be asymptomatic and uh, one of the early clues to that was the Diamond Princess cruise ship, cruise ship um, where out of about 3,700 passengers and crew, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, was detected in 712 individuals. Of those 712, uh, roughly half were asymptomatic at the time of testing and uh, about half were symptomatic. A portion of the symptomatic patients required intensive care and ultimately about 1% of that uh, uh, cohort uh, uh, expired, at least at the time of this publication. Now, about three weeks ago, we had our international HIV conference that was due to be in Boston. It turned into a virtual con uh, uh, conference, but uh, there were excellent presentations on COVID-19. And uh, I'm using one of the slides from one of the presenters that 
really presents a, a schema of the uh, clinical course. So initial, initial presentations may be mild, moderate, severe, critical, and you can see from this graph over time, all of these uh, patient categories can uh, be associated with clinical uh, disease progression and death, and, and all can be associated with recovery. And it's this period of time, uh, which may be uh, one to two weeks where, where this illness uh, runs its course and where uh, recovery can occur or deterioration can occur sometimes very abruptly. So there are some factors associated with the risk of severe disease, uh, older age, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, hypertension, diabetes, and cancer. I recognize when I say these terms that they're relatively broad terms, and I think we don't currently have uh, specificity about each of these categories. So for example, is somebody with complications of diabetes more at risk than individuals that have newly diagnosed diabetes? There has been a gender difference in a number of studies, and uh, I don't think we know whether it's a biologic phenomenon or related to behavioral activities. For example, some of the cohorts, uh, tobacco use was much higher in men than women. Now, we've had an inherent concern about individuals with Im immunocompromising diseases or on immunomodulatory agents. Um, our uh, centers, of course, provide a lot of care for people living with HIV. But I think we've uh, yet to see a clear picture of whether this uh, disease is different within these uh, patient populations. Now, in terms of the age uh, and its relationship to the case fatality rate, uh, this has been something that has been published really widely um, from uh, a variety of cohorts around the world. This is uh, the case fatality rate uh, reported uh, uh, from China. And although you'll sometimes see uh, arbitrary lines, uh, age over 60, age over 65, you can actually see that some of the uh, increase in mortality is uh, detectable in individuals uh, in their 40s and 50s. This was the uh, uh, most recent set of data from the uh, MMWR, the CDC, about the first 2,500 cases of uh, COVID-19 in the United States, looking at hospitalization, ICU uh, admission, and uh, case fatality by age group. And you can see for all of these parameters a, uh, a uh, stepwise increase uh, with age. Now, comorbidities have been associated with risk of death. And so I thought I would, would look at these three different uh, analyses. The first from China was an analysis of 1,023 deaths. And looking at the case fatality rate uh, among individuals with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer, you can see the rates that were quoted. And persons without comorbidities uh, had a case fatality rate of 0.9%. In a study uh, in uh, Italy looking at 355 deaths, um, uh, comorbidities were common uh, in individuals who had died, as listed here. Uh, persons who died had a mean number of 2.7 pre-existing diseases, and only three of 355 deaths were in persons without comorbidities. And in a recent uh, MMWR uh, publication from yesterday, which is really the first uh, uh, look by the CDC to try to sort out uh, the effects of age versus uh, comorbidities. Uh, there's a note that uh, in the subset of patients where there was uh, complete information on comorbidities, 94% uh, of deaths occurred in persons with at least one underlying uh, health condition. Now, the complications of COVID-19, uh, I think, are well known to this group, uh, ARDS, acute uh, cardiac injury with uh, myocarditis, uh, arrhythmias, uh, acute kidney injury, shock, uh, including BIC, and of course, uh, death. There are some laboratory factors that have been associated with severe disease, including severe lymphopenia, uh, leukocytosis, uh, elevations in uh, a number of inflammatory markers in LDH, and then a uh, prolonged uh, prothrombin time. Now, uh, in terms of the clinical management of inpatients with uh, COVID-19, uh, I mentioned that a, a large portion of our current treatment uh, is supportive, including
including management of complications such as cardiac injury, acute uh, kidney injury, progressive pneumonia, secondary infections, and ARDS. And I also wanted to kind of mention the, uh, the response that, that our own institutions are having for this. This is uh, the sit uh, situation report from yesterday, looking at, at uh, uh, four of the hospitals uh, within our uh, academic uh, medical system and look looking at the number of persons under investigation and then individuals who are COVID positive on the floor uh, in the ICU and mechanical ventilation. And I believe we also have a single patient at University Hospital on uh, ECMO. There are actually probably more uh, uncertainties in management of this uh, condition than, 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 than knowledge. And uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, questions about other aspects of management, but I thought from my perspective as an infectious disease uh, physician, these are the uh, uncertainties that come to mind. First, the role of empiric antibacterial therapy. Uh, um, our anecdotal uh, experience from, from my colleagues is that uh, secondary infections are relatively uncommon. But of course, individuals who prevent with uh, profound pneumonia often get empiric antibacterial therapy. Uh, the importance of testing for co-infections. There have been uh, studies that have shown co-infection with influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. We don't really know how common uh, that is occurring. We don't really know the me mechanisms by which age, gender, and comorbidities uh, affect outcome. We really don't know about the management of persons who are immunosuppressed. Um, there have been a relatively uh, few reports on the impact of pregnancy on outcome. And uh, we are in the process of trying to define safe admission and discharge criteria. For example, who should stay home, who needs to be admitted, and then uh, when is uh, discharge safe and to what uh, disposition, to home, to a skilled nursing facility or some other uh, monitored area. And we just know anecdotally that we're probably making uh, mistakes currently where individuals that are, are, are asked to stay at home uh, have deteriorated and come to the hospital. And we've also had examples of individuals who've been uh, discharged and readmitted. A couple areas that I think will be addressed in uh, with Dr. Campbell's uh, presentation are management of the hyperinflammatory syndrome and the role of antiviral therapy and immunomodulators. And then a final area of uncertainty I mentioned is whether infection actually confers immunity. Now, there are some clinical resources, and I think everyone is racing to be the clinical resource of choice. Uh, the CDC and the WHO have, uh, have uh, significant resources. Of course, there's many society links to our, our IDSA, the American College of Physicians, American Thoracic Society, and many others. And there are many links and resources here on campus through the University of Colorado and UC Health, including our Department of Medicine and our Infectious Disease Division. I wanted to mention that the NIH is, uh, uh, has formed a panel on the guidelines for the management of COVID-19. And this will address uh, many questions uh, regarding management, including uh, uh, issues such as prophylaxis, treatment, and some of the uh, critical care management. This is in development, publication is pending but the first set of guidelines may be uh, available uh, as early as next week. So I'd like to stop at this point and uh, I mentioned one of the uncertainties is the uh, treatment and I will switch to uh, Dr. Campbell to talk about uh, therapies for COVID-19. There we go, Tom. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, speak uh, about uh, what we know about treatment approaches for uh, COVID-19. Um, some of the themes uh, that I'd like to point out uh, uh, that course throughout my 
presentation are that number one, our tools are very limited at this point. And because of that, we have to do our best to learn as we go and adapt our approaches as we go. So what I say today will likely be out of date next week. And uh, what comes in to date next week will probably be out of date uh, in the future. So this, uh, this is a rapidly evolving field. Um, because this uh, whole epidemic just started uh, uh, less than four months ago, our data are very sparse. And so it's important that we uh, be data-driven uh, as much as possible, but I'd also say it's important that we uh, keep an open mind uh, in, uh, in how we uh, should approach treatment in our patients. So uh, just as a um, conceptual model to think about treatment, uh, Steve already mentioned that there's a spectrum of, uh, of disease uh, ranging from uh, asymptomatic infection to mild, severe, critical, and multi-organ system uh, failure. What I'd also say is that uh, there's a pattern of inflammation that uh, in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, um, gross ways correlates uh, with uh, the, uh, the clinical presentations. Uh, uh, Sam uh, uh, Wyndham, one of our ID fellows, has uh, taken a look uh, at, real quick look at our data from uh, University of Colorado Hospital. And he's uh, found that uh, a CRP on presentation of uh, 100 or more is highly predictive of subsequent uh, intubation. So there's, I think, a, a lot more to learn about the connection between inflammation and uh, the, uh, uh, the type of disease that our patients uh, are, um, <clears throat> are experiencing. And I think that this is important because it uh, has a lot to do with our treatment approaches. So of course, throughout the spectrum of symptomatic infection, we wanna offer supportive care, um, you know, things from antipyretics to supplemental oxygen. Um, and then we need to think about you know, where do we uh, institute antivirals? And again, this may be a, a changing uh, paradigm, but for now uh, we're reserving antivirals for people with uh, more moderate uh, to severe infection, at least for people who have to be hospitalized and, and require uh, supplemental oxygen. These are not things that we're offering right now to uh, mildly symptomatic uh, patients uh, in the community, but this may change. And then we have to think about uh, where uh, through the spectrum we would want to introduce anti-inflammatory agents. Um, right now, uh, this approach is largely more for the severe and, and critical uh, stages uh, and beyond. And of course, the, the whole point of, uh, of these interventions is to uh, try to keep people uh, from uh, progressing through the spectrum and also to try to minimize their time uh, in the hospital for those that me uh, need mechanical ventilation to try to get them off of the mechanical ventilation as soon as possible, which of course is important for their health, but is also uh, very important for the capacity of our health system. Um, this is a, a complicated diagram. I'm not gonna go through it, but um, this is the, um, the guidance that um, our uh, UCH uh, pharmacy has provided for use of uh, antiviral therapy. It's available on the uh, UCH source uh, webpage. Uh, and so, uh, you can take a, a look at it uh, there if you haven't done so already. Um, but uh, I'm going to go through some of the evidence that supports uh, much of the recommendations uh, in these guidelines. So um, we do have drugs that have antiviral activity uh, against um, the um, uh, uh, SARS-2 coronavirus. And uh, I've shown some of the uh, data here. Don't worry about the, the graphs, but... Uh, in this table, I've uh, shown the, the rank order in terms of the uh, inhibitory concentration uh, or the concentration required to get 50% inhibition uh, in micromolar uh, levels. And uh, you can see that there's quite uh, a, a spectrum uh, of, across some of the things that we're using. Hydroxychloroquine and uh, uh, remdesivir um, uh, have fairly similar uh, IC50s. And then uh, things like chloroquine, um, nitazoxanide, lopinavir, uh, boosted by ritonavir, uh, much uh, higher IC50s. So this gives us an idea of the potency 
based on in vitro inhibition of uh, viral replication. Now, to give you an idea of how uh, this relates to uh, antivirals that we use for other viral infections, you know, uh, these are kind of in the uh, low micromolar, high nanomolar IC50. So, you know, some of the drugs we use to treat HIV or hepatitis C would be a, a good log, uh, order of magnitude, uh, lower IC50 uh, than what we're seeing even for drugs like hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. Um, so these are not necessarily that, uh, that potent. But uh, what do we know about the activity of these drugs in, in people? So this is a, a study um, from a, a group in France. There's a huge number of limitations to the study uh, and flaws in both the analysis and the design of the study. I'm not gonna go into those here, but just to say that this was a non-randomized perspective cohort that looked at people that were treated uh, with um, uh, either no antiviral or hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, and azithromycin. And what they measured uh, is the uh, shedding of a uh, of virus. So this was the percentage of people who were positive on, on a nasal swab. And you can see that uh, in this analysis, there were differences uh, between these groups. What this means in terms of uh, efficacy for treating people, uh, I don't know. I've not uh, seen data to correlate uh, this type of treatment response measured by uh, uh, PCR of nasal swabs with clinical outcomes. And so when we see uh, data like this in the literature, it's important to, to think about what the endpoint was, what were they measuring, and is that really clinical meaning, uh, have clinical meaning? And in this case, uh, I don't know what the clinical meaning of this is. Um, so uh, another uh, study that uh, was published recently in the New England Journal uh, looked at the uh, clinical benefits of lopinavir boosted by ritonavir. So lopinavir is a HIV-1 protease inhibitor. Uh, it requires pharmacokinetic boosting by a, another protease inhibitor that is a potent inhibitor of the CYP3A4 system, and that's ritonavir. And uh, the Chinese were using this drug uh, very extensively uh, during their uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And uh, in the context of that, they conducted a randomized open-label trial not a huge uh, trial, but still a, a decent number of people, 199, probably not enough uh, power to look at uh, clinical endpoints. But, uh, uh, and, and they uh, gave uh, lopinavir or ritonavir at the usual twice a day dose for 14 days and compared that to uh, standard of care. Uh, it's a fairly sick population, 16% on mechanical ventilation, 33% uh, also received adjunct adjunctive uh, corticosteroids. And uh, what you can see in this uh, table is that there were slight differences favoring the lopinavir ritonavir over the standard of care in some of these uh, clinical measurements. Uh, and you know, I think probably the one that strikes me most is there was a 5.8 percent difference in mortality, 19 uh, percent in the lopinavir group, uh, and 25 percent in the standard of care group. With 199 uh, participants in the study, this was nowhere powered to uh, look at a mortality difference. So whether there's any benefit to lopinavir or ritonavir, uh, I don't think we can really say. I think what we can say from this study is that the benefit, if there is one, is not huge. It doesn't rule out a, uh, a smaller degree of, uh, of clinical benefit. Um, another uh, drug uh, that has been, uh, been looked at uh, this is not a drug that has direct antiviral property, uh, but this is a uh, drug that is um, being used to um, uh, prevent or to attenuate, I should say, uh, the uh, um, uh, inflammation and uh, hyperinflammatory response that uh, some people uh, with COVID-19 uh, get. So uh, tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody that acts as a IL-6 receptor antagonist. And uh, in this study, uh, also from China, uh, was a, this was a non-randomized retrospective uh, cohort, very small, 21 uh, patients on the very severe end of the spectrum, uh, and, uh, but only a, a couple, too, uh, on mechanical uh, ventilation. And uh, they received tocilizumab uh, by IV infusion. Uh, most had one dose, but three out of the 21 did get a second dose. And they report some very remarkable 
uh, declines in uh, CRP as well as uh, fever um, uh, occurring as early as uh, one day after uh, tos uh, tocilizumab. Um, there's no uh, clinical other clinical endpoints reported here. We don't know whether tocilizumab affected uh, affected uh, mortality, uh, hospital stay, and, and that sort of thing. There was no control group uh, in uh, in this uh, in this report. Um, another uh, uh, potential way to uh, target the uh, hyperinflammatory response is uh, corticosteroids. We, of course, use corticosteroids to treat a, a variety of conditions and have done that for, for uh, many, many years. Um, and uh, there was a, uh, a report, uh, again, from China in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, another non-randomized retrospective uh, cohort. Uh, 84 people uh, uh, in the cohort had um, uh, ARDS, uh, and uh, in the analysis, those with ARDS who got methoprednisolone uh, had a, a, a decreased uh, risk of death, uh, pretty significant uh, uh, impact uh, uh, with a uh, hazard ratio of 0.38. So again, this has all the limitations of the, of the study design, uh, non-randomized and retrospective. But I think that you know this is something uh, uh, that uh, uh, is going to be important to to look at in the future in uh, more rigorously uh, designed uh, clinical investigations. There's been a lot of uh, interest recently in convalescent plasma. Um, it's been in the press. Uh, I've had uh, patients or family members of patients uh, ask me uh, about this. And uh, I'd say for all the intention that it's got, there's not a whole lot of data to support it. Um, uh, there was a report in JAMA uh, recently of five patients who were uh, transfused with uh, convalescent plasma that had high titers of, uh, of uh, antibody to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and not just by ELISA, but they also had high titers of neutralizing antibody, which is a, a, an important factor. Um, and uh, these patients got uh, the convalescent plasma fairly uh, late into their hospital stay, ranging from 10 to 22 days uh, after admission. Um, all five of the patients were on mechanical ventilation at the time of treatment, and all had also been treated with other antivirals as well as with uh, methyl uh, prednisolone. Um, and uh, what we know from this report is that three uh, were eventually discharged at hospital days 53, 51, and 55. Uh, two are uh, st uh, still in the hospital in stable uh, condition 37 days after the transfusion. So what this means, there's uh, to me, I, I don't know. There's no control group. Uh, these people certainly didn't uh, jump out of bed and walk out of the hospital the next day. They still had very long hospitalizations. Um, there was another uh, report um, in a non-peer-reviewed uh, website uh, also from uh, China that had a slightly larger sample size um, and also reported similar type of observational uh, uh, findings. So I think this is something that also needs uh, more rigorous investigation. So uh, what is the current snapshot of treatment at uh, our hospital? So we've had, um, as of earlier this week, 81 uh, positive cases who were admitted. 54% of those uh, received azithromycin at some point during their hospitalization. 45% uh, uh, were treated with hydroxychloroquine uh, for varying durations. Uh, eight have been uh, enrolled in a, a, a clinical trial of serlumab. Uh, sorry, uh, one has received uh, tocilizumab uh, off-label. One nitazoxanide. One uh, one person has died. 21% uh, uh, have uh, been uh, been discharged. So I want to mention uh, some uh, clinical trials that are going on uh, uh, both uh, here and uh, at Denver Health. Uh, there may be others that I've missed, and I apologize if I've missed any. Uh, and I've just listed these in order that they have uh, rolled out. Uh, Denver Health is participating in a NIAID-sponsored study uh, that is uh, looking at COVID-19 treatment, including uh, the uh, nucleotide analog uh, remdesivir. Um, at UCH, we have an ongoing study of, um, uh, of uh, cerilumab, uh, which uh, is a IL-6 uh, 
uh, blocker. Um, so acts very similarly to tocilizumab uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, we will soon be opening two Gilead-sponsored studies of remdesivir. I'm hoping that they'll open uh, this week. Uh, we're just waiting uh, on the uh, activation by the sponsor. Um, uh, Mark uh, Moss uh, and uh, his group will be uh, opening an NHLBI uh, study uh, sponsored through the pedal network, uh, looking at hydroxychloroquine for uh, early treatment of COVID-19 in hospitalized adults. I think Mark is hopeful that that will open in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think that's a very important study because as you saw from a previous slide, uh, we're using quite a bit of hydroxychloroquine uh, in, uh, at UCH, uh, but we don't really have uh, a rigorous evidence base uh, to support its use at this time. And then uh, finally, I'd mention uh, 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 hopefully in the next month or so, uh, we'll open a NIAID sponsored trial through the AIDS clinical trials group of, uh, uh, of uh, hydroxychloroquine in the outpatient uh, setting uh, for treating uh, COVID-19. So um, uh, I will um, like to end by uh, thanking uh, the nurses who are taking care of these patients. Uh, these uh, nurses, I think, are the, the, rear, the real uh, heroes uh, of this uh, epidemic. They're the ones who are uh, putting their own health at risk uh, every day. And so I just want to give them a shout out. And I'll, I'll turn it uh, back over to David. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, Steve, Eric, and John. Um, we have a lot of questions, and I uh, am going to extend uh, this beyond the hour to answer some of the questions. I want everyone in the audience to know that the slides, uh, the questions, the discussion uh, will all be made available to you electronically. Let me start with the first question, and it combines modeling with the capacity of care. What is uh, our capacity in Colorado and how does the modeling compare to what we'll be able to um, provide for our patients? So <clears throat> this is John, I'll take first crack at that. I mean, part of the reason, of course, we've been doing the modeling is to address exactly that um, issue. There have been uh, efforts to understand uh, what our critical care capacity is. I think at the moment, the figure of 1800 is being used, but at least half of that needs to be uh, available for the other uses uh, for which critical care is done. The, uh, I, I did show from our model a um, projection of critical care needs. And under the sort of uh, degree of social distancing that we're doing now, we would stay within capacity, particularly if brought up quickly. But uh, again, depending on how long we maintain social uh, distancing here, um, what may happen as it's relaxed, it's not clear. I mean, I, I think we are certainly, uh, I'll put it this way, flirting with exceeding uh, capacity. That is recognized and is a, 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 an effort underway to rapidly increase it, as I suspect many of you know. And uh, just to add to that, we are in the process of converting some of our capacity to accommodate uh, these specific patients by increasing our uh, capacity in intensive care. Uh, let me ask a second question, and this relates to uh, inflammation. Uh, are these inflammatory mediators like IL-6, ferritin, uh, CRP helpful in terms of managing patients? And how does that relate to the use of anti-inflammatory agents, not only anti-IL-6, uh, but corticosteroids? Yeah, so uh, what I would say, uh, David, is uh, I don't know. Um, I think that that's uh, a very important question. And uh, I think that, uh, that that's an area where we need a, a good uh, a prospective research study to look at uh, whether or not uh, we can use uh, those type of approaches, anti-inflammatory approaches in a targeted way for people uh, who uh, meet uh, certain uh, thresholds uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, levels of inflammation. So we don't know. Any other thoughts, Steve? 
Yeah, I think, well, of course, some of these uh, elevations have been associated with disease progression. So in that setting, it may, it may help to identify a subset of patients that might get into trouble. It's not clear to me, though, that these inflammatory markers would be you know, independent of other clinical parameters that people were worsening. So follow them clinically in terms of um, hypoxemia, respiratory rate, other vitals. Um, maybe this is a broader question. Why are children relatively spared? We know that there are a number of adults without comorbidities that are certainly developing infection. What, why, why are young people relatively spared of this infection or, or, or the symptoms associated with it? Uh, I, I think that's the million dollar question. I, I, I don't know the answer. Eric, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I would also say it's hard to know. I mean, what's so striking about this uh, is that unlike the U-shaped curve you see for things like influenza and so forth, it's distinctly elderly and it's, uh, it ramps up very much so in the old old. Um, but why children are protected, relatively speaking, well, more than relatively speaking, uh, and also whether they are shedding and uh, asymptomatically, I think are open questions. I, I don't know the answer to, uh, regarding children, but I, I would mention that even though I presented data about the association of age and severe disease, it, there definitely is an incidence of se severe disease uh, in young individuals, including uh, uh, people under 20. Uh, I don't know about children per se, but I, I just think it's a varying kind of rate of developing. But in the setting of a very, very common disease uh, in a big outbreak, we are seeing young individuals. I know anecdotally we have a 19-year-old that is doing poorly. There are a number of individuals that present with myocarditis. Um, we need to know a little bit more about this. Who's at risk for myocarditis? Um, do they truly have myocarditis with the virus infecting uh, the myocardial muscle or uh, the cardiac muscle, or is uh, is this um, or does this relate to a generalized um, end organ failure uh, that you're seeing um, in in um, in extreme cases of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2? Well, I guess I'll, I'll take a, a stab at kind of the, the clinical aspects of thing. And first of all, I would say that the cardiac involvement, at least among hospitalized patients, is not uncommon. And in fact, in some series, up to 30% had some form of cardiac involvement, elevated troponins. Um, and and there have been cases of a, of a fulminant uh, uh, myocarditis leading to death. In terms of whether this is related to the virus or the immune response, uh, I'd have to defer to my colleagues. Well, we, we do know that uh, the ACE2 receptor is present uh, uh, in the heart, so it's very conceivable that, uh, uh, that there is a, a direct viral infection in the heart, but I've not seen any studies on that. And the, the other thing is that uh, some of the antihypertensives we give are known to upregulate that receptor, at least in animal models. You can, you can think virologically and immunological, immunologically that, that could be either good or bad. Um, and I think it'll be important to answer that um, question going forward, um, whether, whether they are good or bad, and, and um, even if there might be some therapeutic um, avenue. But I think it's, a pretty, it's pretty murky because the system's complicated. In terms of immunity, are there individuals uh, that are immune uh, from a previous experience uh, with coronavirus? Um, and once infected with coronavirus and recovered from a coronavirus, how long are you uh, protected? Um, but, uh, just, Eric, I'll take a stab at that first. Um, so it's been known for years that antibody responses to coronaviruses are not necessarily that great. Um, and then they tend to wane with time. And that, that's certainly an issue in the convalescent 
plasma option where only a minority of patients may hit adequate titers uh, for that to be used. Um, and, uh, and so um, it's, there aren't a lot of good data on this. Um, and so, but there, it's, it's, it's certainly not anything like measles where you get that virus, another respiratory virus that can be lethal and you, and you, you have antibody protecting you for the rest of your life. Let me ask a broader question. Um, uh, what, what does this mean for co uh, COVID-25 or, or SARS-CoV-3? In other words, what are the common elements that we could begin to put together in terms of uh, a SARS-CoV-1, uh, 2, 3, 10 uh, infection that would allow us to begin to develop a focused therapy that you could use into the future? Well, um... I think that uh, you know some of the therapies that might come out of this uh, may have activity against other coronaviruses. So, for instance, remdesivir, the nucleotide uh, uh, analog uh, competitive inhibitor of the viral RNA polymerase, uh, has uh, activity against uh, a number of different uh, RNA viruses. And so, you know, that would be an example of a drug that, if it pans out to be effective. Uh, for um, COVID-19 could be effective for uh, future uh, coronavirus uh, outbreaks. But what I would say is it's not that we, you know, maybe it's good to have a drug, but I think if we learn anything from this epidemic, we need to have a, a, a strong uh, public health approach to controlling the epidemic. And, uh, you know, I think the United States uh, uh, has not uh, been a, a great example of that in this case. Let's talk a little bit about the public health approach. Um, what's going to happen when we loosen up the restrictions uh, related to social distancing? Okay, David, I guess I'll, I'll take that one on uh, first. I mean, I, you know, I think it, as I pointed out, I mean, as social distancing reduces infection, which means we have non-immune people who, uh, again, if we release the restrictions and for whatever reason the virus is as persistent as, as it may well be, absent perhaps some unexpected seasonality, uh, we will have more cases. And I think the question is then how is that uh, inevitable uh, rise <laughs> managed? So different strategies have been proposed around reduction of uh, of social distancing and reinstituting some degree of <clears throat> if cases, if and when cases rise. Uh, there's discussion about testing individuals to see who is in fact um, uh, now immune. And there's discussions about um, keeping those who are uh, susceptible to have severe disease, susceptible to die, uh, keeping those people more socially Distant. I, I, you know, I think this is again where modeling will, through some of these strategies, will be the tool we use to decide what uh, course uh, to take. I think most of us doing this kind of work have been so focused on the uptick we haven't started to um, look at the longer uh, at the longer range. Let me go back to the question of therapy and uh, a common approach uh, to coronavirus, the families of coronavirus. Why wouldn't ACE2 or a furin activation site be a target, a therapeutic target for this uh, virus and maybe even the family of viruses? So, um... Yeah, so it, that's possible. The, the thing about um, furin, for example, is it's, a, it's what's called a, pro a, a pre protein convertase. It's a protease, and it's involved in taking a lot of proteins that are made um, in a sort of pre form and then activating them. And that's what the virus is taking advantage of here. It activates that spike protein so that it can then. Uh, use its fusion peptides to create holes in the membrane and, and, and dump its contents into the cell. So 
it's it's a it's a fairly ubiquitous protein, and so inhibiting it broadly would likely have toxic effects. But um, certainly, one could consider uh, ways to inhibit its specific interaction with the um, viral glycoprotein. Uh, ACE2 is in, is, is in the um, whole renin-angiotensin aldosterone uh, system. Um, uh, unlike um, ACE, which we inhibit with drugs, it sort of has a blood pressure lowering effect in that it cleaves angiotensin II. Um, uh, and, but uh, certainly, um, one, one could uh, uh, look at blocking the interaction with either um, small molecules or antibodies. Tom, could you release your screen? There are some in the audience that want to take a picture of the CME um, barcode uh, so that they get credit for this. A big question about, um, about vaccine. Where are we in terms of vaccine development? Um, what's on the horizon, um, and uh, what's realistic? All, all I can tell you uh, is that what I've read in the lay press, that uh, there are vaccines in the early stages of, uh, of clinical trials. Um, I think uh, vaccines, uh, if, uh, if they are proven to be safe uh, uh, and effective will play a big role in controlling the epidemic. I think you know Eric has already pointed out that uh, uh, immunity may uh, may wane with uh, with time, uh, and uh, you know there may be a need to have a seasonal um, coronavirus vaccine, just as we do have a seasonal influenza virus vaccine. Uh, so you know I think that's something we will have to wait and see how it. Uh, plays out, but I, I'm very help, uh, very hopeful that uh, uh, that we'll have a uh, vaccine in the next year or so. A, a really important question also, also is what adjuvant is going to be used, um, and it's my understanding that when some candidate vaccines um, um, actually bought by the U.S. government for study back in the SARS-1 uh, epidemic. Um, those, those uh, I think it was adjuvant dependent that they caused some TH2 directed immunopathology in in um, in animals. Um, so that so it's both the um, immunogen and the adjuvant that has to be figured out. So uh, the asymptomatic population that's infected. Uh, tell us more about that. Uh, those on the Princess cruise ship uh, that uh, were infected but asymptomatic. What happened to them? Um, and how does that relate to healthcare workers that are um, intermittently exposed um, and uh, may be asymptomatic? Should we be screened uh, with um, either? Uh, viral PCR or antibody testing, IgM, IgG antibody testing? So I can certainly start, you know, in the uh, Diamond Princess, you know, about half of the, those individuals that were uh, diagnosed were asymptomatic at the time. In terms of the percentage of those that developed symptoms, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know that, but, but certainly uh, asymptomatic individuals at the time of testing may subsequently develop symptoms. But I think the concept that some people are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic and don't progress is, is, uh, is a true phenomenon. And, uh, and I think, of course, it's, and maybe uh, Jonathan could, could talk about this, but there has been uh, you know, uh, some uh, discussion about the role that uh, asymptomatic individuals uh, have played in the uh, spread of the epidemic. Uh, there also have been proposals to, uh, to screen uh, asymptomatic healthcare workers, as you uh, mentioned. And I think that's one of the uh, areas to consider uh, since our uh, testing capacity has, uh, has improved uh, significantly. Uh, this is John. I really don't have much to add, except, except I think this will be a key issue in thinking about <clears throat> how to manage uh, the infection after uh, social distancing restrictions are uh, are released, because it will certainly uh, complicate um, the challenge of uh, 
applying the usual methods, for example, of contact tracing. So I think this is something we'll have to <clears throat> know more uh, about as strategies are developed. And, and, and I would add that really to understand uh, asymptomatic infection, we need a good serologic assay and then a very large uh, seroepidemiology study. And I've not seen that yet. Yeah, really specific good serology is a missing piece right now, and, and that it'll be incredibly important. I wonder if you could comment on the virulence of the virus. How does this change over time as it's passed from one host to the next? And how does this change with season? Why are viral infections seasonal? So I'll, I'll uh, take a, a go at that. Um, for the, 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 the second part first, um, Viruses tend to be seasonal, a classic example being influenza A, and which circulates from northern to southern hemisphere in sort of predictable ways, although unpredictable in terms of what actually is going to emerge. Um, and it's too early to know whether this virus is going to become seasonal, become endemic, return. Uh, we just don't know yet. Um, a lot of variables into that, but um, it, it uh, is certainly behaving different than SARS-1 um, now. Um, and the other thing that impacts on that, I think has been much discussed in the lay press is um, how does weather and change of season affect the actual biophysical properties of the virus? And there are some reasons to think that uh, as the Northern hemisphere warms and becomes more humid, that that could impact um, transmission um, but it's, there's really no data to predict that at this point. And then in terms of is the virus changing, as I think I said in my talk on one slide, um, you know, this, this virus is, is, uh, is, the virus doesn't want to kill people. It wants to create enough lung and upper airway pathology to create aerosols and spread, and it's doing that very well. Um, that's not to say it couldn't go in either direction of attenuation or worsening, but there's not much, there's really not an indication that that will happen. It seems to have really hit a pretty sweet point for um, spreading itself, which is what viruses want to do, to use an anthropomorphic uh, 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 term. Um, so, um, uh, you know, and, and I, I think another way to think about this is if you look at HIV-1, which has been replicating in humans at a furious pace and many, many millions of people uh, for four decades and before that, um, you really wouldn't, HIV-1 hasn't really changed its, its pathogenicity over those decades. It's really doing what it was doing in 1981. Um, and so there's not strong indications or there are many strains and there are, there are clades in Africa and elsewhere. Um, there aren't any strong indications that that virus has moved in either directions in a major way in terms of its pathogenicity. Um, now, a caveat there is that that virus was probably replicating and evolving at much lower levels since about 1900 and 1930, before it came up on the radar in the 80s. Um, and this, this virus probably uh, is much more recent. So there's a chance it would change, but we just don't know. I, it's a kind of a data-free zone at this point. Let me ask, uh hematologic question, two part. Uh, are there blood types, uh, individuals with blood types that are more susceptible uh, to this uh, virus? And, um, and what's the role of micro uh, thrombi in terms of, of causing end organ disease in individuals with uh, coronaviral infection? Well, I'll let others speak as well. I know that there's at least one paper that, that showed some difference uh, in outcome among different blood types. I, I, I can't remember the paper with enough specificity to tell you, but that has been a factor that has been uh, evaluated. And then in terms of microthrombi, certainly uh, DIC has been uh, a, uh, a significant complication in the course of uh, in the clinical course in people that have developed uh, some serious disease. There have been uh, several questions about testing. Um, 
And, and I think the testing questions uh, go something like this. When will we reach a capacity where we can uh, move from testing those that we think have disease to a case finding approach, first of all, and secondly, what will the role of IgG, IgM uh, uh, serology be in testing broad cohorts of individuals? Well, I'll let others uh, speak as well, but, but, but I do think our, uh, our capacity for testing has uh, in, increased dramatically, such that I think we can use it for other purposes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, many um, uh, algorithms for uh, discharge criteria are using uh, serial testing for that. And uh, I think we have the capabilities, for example, to test inpatients to uh, document clearance of the virus that then might allow them uh, a disposition like to a skilled nursing facility and so on. Um, I, I've had some, we had some discussions yesterday at, at one of our leadership meetings and uh, I've talked with members of the virology lab and they feel that our current testing capability is quite uh, robust. Okay, I have one last question. Um, and uh, the last question focuses on flattening the curve and future outbreaks. Um, what can we expect over the next two, three years in terms of uh, COVID-19, uh, do we expect it to stay within the population and continue to have uh, recurrent um, uh, smaller uh, outbreaks of the disease or uh, is the thought that this will, um, will eventually um, wane over time and, um, and uh, um, will not see COVID-19 in the future? Well, this is John. It's a great question that we can't answer um, right now. I, I mean, I think you know others may want to uh, weigh in, but of course, that two or three year time frame is the one in which we would hope to have a successful uh, vaccine. Maybe the therapeutics will be developed, uh, and the diagnostics will be at a level where uh, we can avoid um, cases, uh, individuals who are ill who will transmit. Um, the disease using our almost classic methods of uh, controlling infectious diseases. But I, I think that's a uh, timeline where I hope we can be uh, optimistic. And I will leave it to my virology colleagues to say whether the virus will decide uh, to, uh, to go away. I think we dodged a bullet with SARS and we certainly didn't hear. Okay, well, I want to thank the speakers, um, uh, thank the participants, and especially uh, thank the healthcare workers that are at the front, uh, in the front line, in the fire, taking care of patients and uh, doing their best to deal with it, the challenges uh, that uh, COVID-19 is uh, presenting to us and presenting to our patient population. I also want to thank our hospital partners who have done a tremendous job in terms of aligning uh, with us and supporting us in our ability to take care of these very sick patients. Thanks very much. The presentation will be online and available to you.